Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 139th video cast, 129th podcast for the week ending June 16th, 2022. Uh, I'm recording this at 10 a.m. on Thursday, so I will be watching the market while we're doing this and uh, may have to pause to put in some orders. But uh, we've got a lot of good stuff to uh, talk about today. Uh, first, we'll start with the media. Uh, quick thank you to Ellie Terrett and Ashley Webster for having me on the Claim and Countdown on Fox Business on Tuesday. We'll go into that a little bit later. Also want to thank Ryan Gallagher uh, and Phil for having me on CGTN America. Uh, you can watch that. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then Mitch Hawk and Zoltan Saranyi for having me on Benzinga. Uh, we'll go into that in the article of the week. We've got so much to cover today, so I'm going to rush through some of this. Reuters, I want to thank Minaz Yasmin and David Barbusia for including me in their article. Um, and that was about the high yield market. And then uh, this one is from ZU. This was an article in Reuters about Alibaba. Uh, I said, quote, there will be setbacks and bumps along the way, but the tide has changed uh, and uh, and meaning things are things are starting to recover there. So excited about that. The big thing I want to cover is the Cooper Standard um, uh, sell off uh, in the last two day and a half, two days. And this is a new large holding for us in the last few weeks. Uh, we've now made it a bigger holding in the last 24 hours, and I want to discuss why. Um, they put out this press release after the market closed on Tuesday, and the stock just got crushed in the after hours, and then it continued the next day. And basically what they said, June 14th, Cooper Standard Holdings announced today that it has retained Goldman Sachs and company as the financial advisor to assist the company in analyzing and evaluating potential alternatives for refinancing its capital structure. Uh, as of March 31st, Ca uh, Cooper Standard had total liquidity of $395 million, including availability under the company's amended senior asset-based revolving credit facility. Additionally, uh, subsequent to the end of the quarter, they received $51 million in cash, uh, refunds, carryback, da 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 so how the market interpreted this is different than what it actually said. Um, the market interpreted this as a restructuring. And uh, I don't blame the market totally for this. Um, this is like an announcement saying, uh, dear friends and family, um, uh, my wife and I intend to get pregnant and have a baby at some point in the near future. Uh, versus, uh, dear family, uh, you know, Caitlin and I are having a new child. Uh, we're so excited. Uh, this is a premature note that uh, looks like what a company would put out when they're restructuring versus, quote, refinancing. Um, this would be more problematic if they didn't already tell you what they were going to do in the earnings call, which I guess most of the sellers uh, that were dumping did not listen to or read the uh, co conference call a few weeks ago. And here's what they said, quote, in terms of our balance sheet, the company is focused on extending the maturity of some of the debt in our capital structure this year. We are monitoring the markets and are considering all refinancing, not restructuring, refinancing options available to us. To assist us in this process, we have ongoing discussions with our long-term banking partners to understand market dynamics as well as help identify the most suitable approach and timing for refinancing. While the nearest of our debt maturities is November 2023 on our term loan B, depending on market conditions, we may also consider refinancing to include both the term loan as well as our senior secured notes to further extend average weighted maturity of our debt. That uh, um, concludes my prepared comments. That was from the CFO just a few weeks ago. So what they said they were doing 
Uh, and I think they actually in the Q&A said they would be announcing that in coming weeks is exactly what they did. Now, um, I did call the company and ask them, uh, you know, why did you put out this note? Usually you put this out to announce that you've done the refinancing, not to say you're going to do the refinancing. Uh, and that's why your stock is down because it looks like a restructuring. Uh, I know from listening to your call that it's a refinancing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I went back to 2020 where they did do a refinancing. Um, uh, uh, they didn't do a refinancing. They actually raised cash in the middle of the pandemic, $200 million worth just to buy them time because OEM production was shut down uh, from the, uh, you know, uh, from the major uh, uh, car producers. Uh, and when they put out press releases in 2020, you can go back and look at the 8Ks, they made the statements that we have 12 months worth of liquidity, uh, you know, et cetera. And the difference between then and now, the reason they put, um, the company... The reason they put that they had 12 months back then versus now, they're saying the company expects its currently li current liquidity position will provide sufficient resources to support ongoing operations and the execution of planned strategic initiatives for the foreseeable future. Why did they use foreseeable future here and 12 months there? The reason they did 12 months there is because the OEMs were shut down and assuming that production didn't come up soon because you were in a middle pandemic, no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, they had 12 months worth, worth of cash. Here, they have an ongoing business. The production, uh, as we know, which has created the opportunity, is is down from pre-pandemic levels, but it's sharply coming up as the chips come in, and that will be more accelerated in, in the second half of the year. So when they say foreseeable future, what they're basically saying is we have enough cash and we expect to be uh, generating cash to be self-sustaining but we would like to refinance the debt, which they've repeatedly said. And what we've repeatedly said is the next catalyst to take the stock from, you know, what was $5 to probably 20, 25 on the refinancing announcement, which should come this year. And, uh, and then from there, it's going to be the business getting back to normalized EBITDA of 300, 350 million. And that's how you get a 10 or 20 plus bagger. Uh, so we have used this weakness yesterday and today this morning to buy more stock. Um, the other thing, I just want to cover a few uh, points here. Um, and that, okay, for the future, okay, so I've covered that. Uh, and, and, and that's the name of the game. And the company has indicated, so here's what I would say. What's changed between three weeks ago when they said the exact same thing and today is the fact that um, where, when they talked about possibly doing the senior secured loan with the uh, term loan, I would say since the Friday CPI report, the, ter the senior secured is off the table. I'm pretty excited about that simply because we're going to cover what happened in 1994 after they did the 75 basis point hike in November 1994. Eight months later, they were cutting rates. And I would almost guarantee you within the next 12 months, the Fed will be cutting rates again. So all they need is the 350. So it's a non-issue for the maturities of next December which they can do with their eyes closed. They'll probably pay up in this environment, but they'll get it done. Uh, and maybe that takes the stock to, you know, 10 or 15 bucks since they're not doing the whole 700 million. But, you know, next year when the Fed starts cutting, uh, they can go back and they can refinance the whole thing again. Plus they'll have operating cash flow, operating leverage coming in. The chips will be in. There will be a glut of chips. The, the OEMs will be able to, yeah, car sales are going to slow, but there's a two-year backlog uh, for cars already sold, and they've got to build up deal dealer inventory. So um, we like it. Uh, we thank these people for selling. And like we said when we first put this out, uh, stop, the, the good news about 
stocks that are down 90% is that they can be 25 baggers in some cases uh, if you do the proper analysis. Uh, the bad news is a stock that's down 90% can go down another 90% before it's a 25 bagger <clears throat> uh, from your init initial basis. So uh, all these things do is um, create opportunities to increase the position. The issue is what do you sell to generate the cash to put in your potential 10 or 20 bagger versus what you have and you look at the other things in your portfolio and you say well the maximum this is going to be is a double over the next three years so i'm going to sell half of this and i'm going to put it into this one <clears throat> that i think could be 10 or 20 bagger over the next three to five years and um and and, and that's just how you how you deal with it and and how you um work out these situations but in my view <clears throat> I think they said enough. My sense is the reason they put this out was that um, they wanted to clarify to the market uh, because as you saw, many board members and the, and the CEO were writing big checks to buy stocks uh, before the uh, blackout period uh, in March, in April, etc. They were buying stocks at much higher levels than this and that's one of the reasons i got in the company they own 5.2 percent of the company at much higher levels than we do um um so they're not going to do a dumb deal they're not going to do debt with warrants in my view uh or some dumb deal with a hedge fund and give up equity the key reason i got into this stock is if you look at the share count over the last 10 years through up and down cycles they did not it did not change much at all. It's been about 17 million every single year for the last 10 years, which tells me they respect equity and they'd rather do a deal where they have to pay more in interest than screw the equity holders. And I respect that. And they've got skin in the game. So even if they have an ideology is one thing, uh, and I appreciate ideologies, but I, I want them to be hit harder in their pocketbook than in my pocketbook if they do a dumb deal. And that's exactly what will happen. So uh, my sense is they put this press release out, which was a little silly season, uh, I have to admit. But my sense is they wanted to clearly state to the market, uh, in case they weren't clear enough in the last earnings call, that they're not doing a restructuring. They're simply refinancing the maturities that come due at the end of next year and in the following year, potentially, uh, uh, etc. The other thing that was interesting is Adam D sent me all the volume on the senior unsecured, which was trading at 40 cents. When we uh, started our equity position, it got up to 54 cents. I think it's trading at 51 cents yesterday. But there's been an elephant in there buying five and 10 million and two million, particularly after the earnings call. I think there was one day of 20 million. So someone's in there scooping up that bargain. Um, we feel the risk on the senior unsecured is similar to, uh, the, uh, equity. So we want the, we want the 25% up, we want the potential 20, 25, uh, upside in exchange for commensurate risk. But my sense is it's either the company itself or it is a high yield fund, uh, credit fund buying it, getting a 30% yield, knowing it's going to be taken out at par probably within the next two years or much sooner. So that's the story on Cooper. Uh, could it go lower? Absolutely, it could go lower. Uh, and then I'll just have to figure out what's in my portfolio that I think is going to double uh, versus go up 10 or 20x. And I'll sell that off and I'll buy more Cooper Standard uh, is, is my, my view with, with this. So um, hope that helps. Moving along, uh, this is from last week. Okay, we'll get on to China here. China exports to the rest of the world surged in May as COVID-19 restrictions ease, adding to signs of recovery in the world's second largest economy. Okay. Um, already have an account. China tech titans make a comeback as U.S. peers stumble. Optimism on Beijing crackdown fuels turnabout in sentiment. So I'm just going to go through these so you can just see how opinion follows trend. You know, Alibaba had bounced 60% uh, off of its March lows once the government pivoted on the crackdown uh, and started reopening the country. Now it's up, I think, 40% off the lows. I uh, don't have it in front of me for today. Uh, 
Okay, and then uh, Beijing gives initial nod to revive IPO Ant after crackdown cools. Uh, this is interesting. So people have been disputing this, but as we said last week, um, you know, Ant has to say no because they don't want to piss off the government like Didi did. But Ant, Warburg valued Ant at $180 billion at the end of March, which is down from $300 billion when they were originally going to go public. But it's amazing it's held up this valuation, uh, which means $60 billion is, is uh, owned by uh, shareholders of Alibaba. Alibaba owns uh, one third of it. This is going to be a trillion dollar company. So eventually that stake will be worth more than the whole market cap of Alibaba right now. Oh, and by the way, you get an amazing uh, cloud business and uh, the best online retailer in Asia uh, for free, basically, uh, if you look a few years forward. So we know that uh, whether this happens in July or whether it happens at the end of the year or next year, we know that they brought on the chairwoman of the Hong Kong Exchange uh, for a reason, and, uh, and it will be up to the CCP when they execute. Uh, China's car sales begin to rebound as government revs up subsidies. So coming out of, uh, well, going into and coming out of uh, lockdowns, China is putting pedal to the metal, and we'll talk about why in just a second. Why does this keep locking me out of my own account? Um, Okay, China markets spring back into action as COVID lockdowns ease. All right, I'm going to have to log into that. Uh, JP Morgan now says Chinese assets are a good diversifier right now. Um, Goldman sees end of selling in Chinese stocks, but CCB Everbright say only volatility is assured. All right, that's fair. Uh, you've just been through the war. Most factories in Shanghai resume to work as COVID controls ease. Next, uh, this is interesting. Uh, one of the education stocks, which was one of the huge ones, I think this ticker is EDU, China's new oriental education giant finds new life in English live streaming. Uh, so climb for the fourth straight day Wednesday's analysts saying it's new live streaming sales strategy could help it recover from a regulatory crackdown that decimated its education business. So they just pivoted to a new business. That's pretty amazing because some of those are beat to death. Uh, China economic data beats across the board in apparent zero COVID policy victory lap. And here are the points of, uh, success that the CCP points out to pat themselves on the back. Industrial production shifted from decrease to increase and equipment manufacturing industry rebounded markedly. You can just uh, see the data here. This was in the uh, daily reads. Decrease of index of services production slowed down and modern service industry sustained growth. Market sales picked up and sales of goods for basic living and online retail sales continued to grow. In May, the total retail sales of consumer goods reached 3.3 billion yuan, down 6.7% year on year. 4.4 percentage points slower than the previous month or a month on month uh, increase of 0 0.05. Analyzed by different areas, the retail sales of consumer goods in urban areas reached 2.9 billion yuan, down 6.7%. And that in rural areas reached 434 billion yuan, down 6.3. Grouped by types of com consumption, the retail sales of goods was 3.05 yuan. Uh, the consumption for basic living grew steadily. Retail sales, da, 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 first five years, consumer goods. Online, okay, total, the online retail sales totaled 4, totaled 4.9 billion yuan, up 2.9%. So in the middle of the lockdown, uh, their businesses increased. Specifically, the online retail sales of physical goods were 4.2 billion yuan, up 5.6%, accounting for 24.9% of the total retail sales of consumer goods. 1.1 percentage point higher than in the first four months. So this is mind boggling. While the worst case scenario was happening and Shanghai was completely shut down, online retail sales uh, went up. And who gets the biggest share? Alibaba's rocking and rolling, Tencent, JD. Uh, this is pretty exciting to see. Investment in fixed assets increased steadily and investment in high tech industries grew fast. Uh, growth of imports and exports of goods accelerated and trade structure continued to improve. Urban surveyed unemployed rate dropped. Consumer price maintained stable and growth of uh, stable and growth of pr producer prices for industrial products continued to slow down. So their CPI and PPI were slowing. So look, 
everything that's going wrong in the West right now is going right in the East right now. And that's why we're a little ahead of the curve on this, but this is the way it's going. And um, uh, basically, you have this divergence. The rest of the developed world is tightening like crazy. Uh, Europe and uh, United States, while only two economies in the world are easing, uh, Japan, which has been easing for 30 years, it hasn't really helped, and China, which has been easing for the last, since November, but aggressively coming out of the lockdown, and none of that November through May can be felt while they were in lockdown, it crushed it all, so coming out of lockdown, that's in the pipeline, it works on a lag basis, we got the China National Congress coming up, uh, and now to, to see the numbers starting to turn the corner so quickly uh, is, is very nice to see. Um, this is it, interesting. Meet China's new live streaming e-commerce star, an English language tutor who, who lost his off-campus teaching job, so now he's in the live streaming business. They adapt quickly, uh, full capacity on the factories. Uh, all right, I got it. I don't know why this logged me out, but I got to log in here because I can't just keep getting, okay, not showing you the password, but you got the username. I don't know if that's going to help you. You're going to need some really high speed quantum computer to, uh, to get in. Let's see. All right. So now they want to email me the code. Why China's 2022 Party Congress will be a landmark? I think this is a key point in this article. Um, four. What are the current priorities for the China National Congress in November? Quote, to deliver stability and economic growth while stamping out Any new COVID outbreaks. China set an ambitious growth target of 5.5% for 2022, but that looked increasingly difficult to achieve after pandemic-related lockdowns disrupted manufacturing and consumer spending in the first half of the year, uh, etc. And uh, and that's that's that. So they want to push the economy, and they're doing doing those things to, to do it. Um, Chinese stocks are looking cheap. Fund manager explains why he's betting on Alibaba. Opinion follows trend. This looks like it was published right after the 60% move off the lows. Uh, let it rot. China's tech workers struggle to find jobs. So Beijing's assault on big tech has last led to mass dismissals as COVID-19 lockdowns batter economic growth. Good for the companies. Their margins are going to increase. Bad for the government who shot themselves in the foot. So now they're going to have to build it back up Tencent and Alibaba in order for these businesses to rehire these people uh, that have been at the effect of uh, excessive government policies. ECB, uh, moving on to the West. ECB very open to stepping in if markets overreact. What does that mean? It means that after the CPI report on Friday, the yields blew out on uh, some of the pigs bonds. That's part of the reason for this uh, disorder in the market. Uh, you're going to have Portugal, Italy, uh, Greece, Spain, uh, etc. starting to have yields blow out. They, they come back in and they said, yeah, we said we're doing quantitative tightening and raising uh, rates, except for the fact that we're now going to buy bonds, even though it's not quantitative easing. We're just going to and it's not uh, we're going to keep doing quantitative tightening, but we're going to also do quantitative easing uh, like whack-a-mole. Uh, just to keep bonds low, but we're not going to call it quantitative easing because we're really doing quantitative tightening. And if that confused you, it didn't confuse the market because as soon as they said that Italian yields collapsed, bonds went up. And uh, I think this more of this is coming to a theater near you. Question is how soon it's going to be before Powell comes out and says, yeah, I know we were going to roll off the balance sheet. Uh, we're going to still do that, but we're also going to be buying bonds. Uh, which is basically the opposite of rolling off the balance sheet. My guess is it takes them a few more months, but um, but that's what's already happened in Europe. So they're not going to be able to tighten as quickly as they think or as aggressively as they think. And eventually they're all going to grow weary of the war in Russia, Ukraine, and they're going to force an agreement uh, and get that production back online one way or another because their political stability depends on it. 
So the question is, you know, politicians always make the right decisions after they, after they exhaust every other possibility. Uh, Wharton Professor Jeremy Siegel is one of the best stock watchers alive. He says the S&P is already pricing in a recession and a bear market. I kind of agree with him. I mean, maybe we've got a little lower to go. A lot of people are pointing to the um, to the uh, uh, 3,500 level because it's a 50% retra retracement like the, you know, Fibonacci numbers and the magical, mystical seashells and all that stuff. Uh, what's the difference? You know, 3,500, 3,700, 3,800. Uh, it just becomes silly season. You got to look at stocks on a one-on-one -on -one basis and just find things that are just too cheap in any possible scenario when you look two years out. Um, stores have too much stuff. Here's where they're slashing prices. So all of these, you saw it with Target, Walmart's going to be next, um, Macy's, they're all going to, they've got a glut of inventory. Some of it's related to, they bought a ton of uh, Crocs and they bought a ton of, uh, I don't know if it's Crocs, but call it sweatshirts and sweatpants and people want party dresses and high heels. Uh, so they're going to be selling that stuff at massive discounts. So that's going to help start to help some inflation numbers. The number one thing is energy though. We've got to get that done. Um, U.S. home equity hits its highest level on record 27.8 trillion. So that buys the consumer some time. They still have way more savings uh, today than they did before the pandemic. So the consumer has a little bit of runway. They still feel rich from their house equity, uh, but uh, you know their market equity is going down temporarily. So that's going to rein in uh, some spending, which is the goal of the Fed. I mean, they, they basically know uh, they can't control the supply chain, although that's getting better. Uh, they can't control oil prices, although production is going up. Uh, they can't control the war outcome. Uh, all they can do is destroy demand. Uh, and that's exactly what they're trying to do with the 75 basis point hike. Uh, they're uh, unfortunately going to realize that they succeeded more than they intended because policy always works on a lagged basis. Uh, but if this is anything like 1994, which it may not be, but it also may be, uh, they'll be cutting uh, much sooner than most people think. My guess is maybe one more 50 to 75 basis point hike. Uh, and then possibly a 25 to 50 in September. And then I would say, if not before the end of the year, first quarter of next year, they will be cutting rates again. Um, okay, uh, Biden ways ending some China tariffs soon. And by the way, uh, them cutting rate again doesn't like concede defeat or anything. It's just all they need to see is that the inflation numbers are starting to come down. Like we saw with the PPI actually has peaked since, since April. PPI leads CPI, so maybe we'll get some reprieve there. But we need more new cars to do that, to, to drop the used car prices, and hopefully a break uh, in energy, whether it's from increased production and or demand destruction or both, or a lucky break with the silly war, which uh, is completely ridiculous. So, um, okay, Biden weighs ending some China tariffs soon in response to inflation. This will be great uh, for uh, U.S.-China relations, which will also help, by the way, Cooper Standard uh, will also help uh, flows to China, Alibaba, et cetera. So we're, we're positioned for something like that. God forbid he makes an intelligent decision uh, in terms of what the market needs at the moment. Uh, I don't agree with it politically, I mean, but I do think that... Uh, uh, it would help our portfolio. That's all I can say. I, I, I don't think it's probably the right decision, but I think it helps. And we got a position for the hand that we're dealt, not the hand that we want. Uh, markets disappointed after ECB concludes a uh, short on detail emergency meeting, which is basically yield spiked. And they decided overnight they were going to be a buyer of bonds again. You know, the, the kind of play here is that Japan is supposed to be the buyer of last resort. It's basically coordinated central bank action everyone else has more inflation than they want, except for Japan. Uh, Japan is trying to lock in that 25 basis point ceiling on their 10-year JGBs. So they're buying quote unlimited amounts of JGBs. They've been tested this week. Uh, but the goal is that, that uh, you know, money is still free in, in Japan. So the idea is that an arbitrage picks up and the Bank of Japan becomes the quantitative easing for Europe and for the United States because their money is free and they can get yields of three, four, five percent in Europe and in uh, U.S. So as uh, the U.S. central bank and the ECB comes out of the market as a buyer of bonds, Japan can step in, they can make money, 
And but oh, by the way, they devalue their currency, which gives them an exporting advantage uh, against the rest of the world. So they're all in. Uh, the, the West is all in. They need a buyer of their bonds. Japan's all in. They want an export advantage by a weakened currency. So in theory, it should work great. And maybe the ECB won't have to be in as aggressive, back in as aggressively as they think. But, uh, but the EC, uh, BOJ has to uh, have the firepower. Uh, and they have to stop fighting their own fire because uh, the vigilantes are testing their own bond yields. And they want to keep it below 25 basis points on the 10-year. So my guess is as that stabilizes, you'll see them more and more in European and U.S. markets. Our yields will stabilize, and um, and this and things will start to look a lot better. As far as this overnight uh, silly season, this looks like um, the rumors is that the Swiss bank raised raised uh, 50, 50 basis points, uh, which was a surprise. But more than that, they own one hundred seventy eight billion dollars of U.S. equities, and the rumors were they're in the market selling to raise a little cash uh to cushion the blow so if that's the case and they and the, and if you looked at their filings the stocks that are getting hit the hardest were the stocks in their public filings so maybe there's some merit to that but sooner or later that unnatural selling goes away and then we figure out uh what's changed about the business in the last two weeks okay and uh uh you know how does the business look two years from now and how is it valued relative to that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start to look at businesses for businesses versus, you know, risk on risk off buttons by big, big allocators that are caught on the wrong side. So uh, hedge fund selling was never more furious than in the last two days. So look, I mean, you look at these things and generally you want to buy when there's blood in the streets. I mean, there, you know, that's a, a thing. These things can stay pessimistic for a little longer. It can go a little lower, but you know, your risk reward starts to become skewed, especially if you look on a business by business basis. Uh, here's OK. This this one came out today and this one I love. This author at Barron's has never written a positive article about China or about China stocks in her entire career. Uh, now, with Alibaba up a bit uh, off the bottom, she comes out with Alibaba stock is popular among bargain hunters now. So uh, it must have pained her. Like I, I could see her hand shaking while she wrote this, or I guess typing. Uh, uh, but um, but she seems to be coming around, and more and more will come around. Opinion follows trend as it goes up. I, my guess is it'll be down a little bit today, and then you know we'll get a nice negative article from her tomorrow. Like uh, you can never trust a rally in China, uh, just as things are getting started. Uh, we have a pullback and, and, oh, there are rumors of new lockdowns in XYZ city with uh, tens of millions of people stay away. But for now, today, she's positive And for that, uh, we applaud. Um, OK, this big oil response to Biden's threats. Here are 10 things you can do to ease gas prices. So basically, Biden said, you need to produce. You can't buy back stock anymore. Uh, or we're going to, you know, punish you somehow with taxes, tax you to death or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they basically said, uh, well, that's all fine and dandy, but you need to do your part as well. Number one, lift development restrictions on federal land and waters. Two, designated critical energy infrastructure projects. Three, fix the NEPA permitting process. Four, accelerating LNG exports and approved pending LNG applications. Five, unlock, unlock investment and access to capital. This has been the bi biggest problem with the uh, ESG greenwashing that uh, banks have limited financing to quote unquote dirty businesses. And that's what's created this shortage. Uh, dismantle supply chain bottlenecks, advance lower carbon energy tax provisions, protect competition in the use of refining technologies, end permitting obstruction on natural gas projects, and advance the energy workforce of the future. Exxon came out, I think Exxon came out directly and basically said, approve the Keystone Pipeline. This is the most ridiculous thing uh, ever. And you've created this as much as anyone else. Uh, so rather than pointing fingers, how about you look in the mirror and help us out, help us help you help the world. Uh, and hopefully the administration will finally actually listen uh, from what people have been saying since before the election when they laid out this plan that would lead to this disaster, which it has, 
I'm not saying that the war hasn't also exacerbated it, but um, it's just uh, short-termism, and uh, and that's the results that we're seeing. So looking at, uh, we've got a lot of indicators to go through today because I want you to understand where we are in terms of a risk-reward type of breakdown. Um, this is the 10-day put-call ratio, very elevated, most elevated since uh, the pandemic lows. I uh, feel like a broken record here, but I mean, this this is the fact. I mean, this is just a cascade of deleveraging. You have the crypto cl crypto people that are um, uh, getting smoked. Uh, that one guy who levered up his balance sheet micro strategy, probably getting a margin call under 21,000, I think was the uh, notes that I saw. So you're going to just see the knock on effect for a lot of leveraged money out there that's going to get puked out. Uh, unnatural selling, unnatural prices. And once they're flushed out, you'll go back to natural prices, see where the economy is and, and move from there. Again, NASDAQ, EMA, advanced decline ratio. I mean, this is this is crazy season. Like the amount of uh, selling and the extremes. I mean, there, there's there been no time that these things get this low that you don't want to be a buyer versus a seller, a net buyer versus a, versus a seller. Um, But that's not to say, you know, it doesn't bottom a little lower. We don't know. But just look throughout history. You want to be a buyer, not a seller at these levels. That's healthcare. Um, so some of these can go a little bit lower, but most of them are at their extremes. You know, PMO buy all is back down to zero. So maybe it takes a few days to bottom or a couple of weeks maybe. But um, these are let's put it this way. These are not levels you want to be puking out stocks. Whether you're buying slowly and over time, fine. But, uh, uh, you know, if you're selling now, uh, odds don't favor your, your um, doing yourself any favors. But, you know, all you can look at is probabilities in this business. There are no certainties. Uh, the only certainty you can do is buying a high quality business with a moat. Uh, or in a special situation that you can take the time arbitrage over time and that's where you make your money and just ignore the short-term silly season uh, and know what you own. That That's your biggest play uh, versus picking tops and bottoms is picking businesses and industries where it's just gone two bananas and you wait for all the leverage to out and as soon as it does, it, it rips right back like a, like a rubber band and uh, or a Super Bowl actually it bounces up higher uh, than it fell to start with. So um, yeah, I mean this. How many times do you want to see this where it's time to buy, not time to sell? But um, the skew. This is uh, last time it was this low was at the pandemic lows. Uh, there's nothing left to insure. Everyone's out of stocks. They're in cash. Um, you know, when you want to consider, uh, lightening up is when skews high and everyone's insuring for, uh, you know, two standard deviation moves, uh, this two standard deviation move already happened. So, uh, the house is already burnt down. If you want to, if you want to buy insurance on it, have at it, but, um, you know, probably, probably not, not the best timing. Um, okay. So that's it on those indicators. Bullish percent by sector, communications obviously at an extreme, NASDAQ at an extreme, this was a buy time, this was a buy time, this was a buy time, this was a big buy time, this was a big buy time. So, I mean, could it go lower? Sure, it could go lower, but your odds favor being a buyer. You know, if it goes another 10% lower, uh, just think about where is it going to be when it's back up to 75, even if it takes a couple of years, um, you know, this is where you want to step in and buy quality on sale. Um, and but you got to look at a sector by sector. So that's the Nasdaq. Uh, energy has come down, but it's not not back down to the bottom yet. So I think that's got more to go. Banks are getting closer to the bottom. <coughs> you know, twenty five to fifty eight on uh, Wells Fargo. It's back down to thirty eight. Um, you know, we would consider stepping back in here. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean that was a beautiful run from twenty five to fifty eight. But uh, at 38, the, the story, the narrative starts to ramp up again. It's starting to trade at a meaningful discount to book. 
uh, and I think it could be attractive. Uh, uh, healthcare sector, again, these were times to buy, not times to sell. Um, so, you know, uh, these are the things we look at. Now let's look at commodities. Okay, so the dollar has not started weakening yet, but commercials are still selling. So do you get, you know, more of this? You get a blow off top and then and then a, and a rollover? It could be, but, um, you know, even down at these levels, eventually you see some weakness. Uh, not yet, but we'll see. Uh, let's see what else here. I wanted to go through some commodities just to show you that basically everything other than energy is weakening. And uh, the Fed's probably, if they do, the good thing is he was tempered. He said, this is an exception, not a rule. The market wanted it, so it gave him what he wanted. You look at the euro here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, commercials have been big buyers. It takes some time sometimes before you get the rally after they're big buyers. The green line is the commercials. But um, they're up at the levels. You know, euro looks like it's going to hell. Uh uh, on a chart basis, but the smart money is buying it. You know, hedge funds have been shorting it, uh, but commercials have been buying and they're, they tend to be the correct money, uh, you know, here over and over. So, you know, watch, watch the euro and the dollar reversal. That could be tell, that could tell you something about when things are going to change, when the dollar starts to weaken and the euro starts to strength, maybe we'll see some risk back on um okay australian dollar i don't know why this third computer is running so slow okay all right um all right this is the pound commercials have been buyers similar to the euro chart that's kind of interesting everyone thinks the pound's going to zero um canadian dollar sorry uh canadian fellow people it doesn't really matter in the global scheme of things look at the yen yen is in the tank uh that's partially by design but commercials getting up to these levels again where it did get a little bit of a bid especially in 2007 2015 2017 we'll see um all right this is taking long so i'm going to move on and then we'll come back to it if we have time uh so this is from rbc wealth management they're talking about this 50 percent target on the s p 500 taking us back to this uh resistance now comes support at 3505 everyone's looking at it uh, you also have, uh, I guess this is a 50-day moving average. Is it 50-day or 200-week moving average? So um, so everyone's looking at it. Maybe that's the magnet. Maybe that's your capitulation flush that everyone's been looking for. But, you know, trading at 15 times next year's earnings, even if they come down a little bit, um, you know, with the 10-year still at 340, uh, you know, and here we've got this little breakout. We had that before. We had that uh, also in uh, different periods, but uh, like 2018. Uh, so that's yields. There's the dollar. And this is very interesting. So revisiting China as its equity indices continue to positively diverge from the U.S. markets. We are revisiting the Chinese equity markets again this week to illustrate their improvement despite weakness in most other equity markets. As a reminder, Chinese equities were one of the first areas within equities to peak in early 2021 and begin bear markets. We fully appreciate many investors uh, consider Chinese equities to be too risky, but we view them as a barometer for global investors' appetite for risk and therefore important to monitor. Market bottoms are a process and not an event, so it is noteworthy that one of the first areas to turn down in 2021 are showing signs of bottoming in 2022. So here's the Shanghai Shenzhen CSI 300 index on a weekly chart. Uh, so it bounced off that trend. And then here's the NASDAQ Golden Dragon China index, which is basically the tech index and breaking that downtrend uh, support line. So all of that is positive short term, impressive resilience while other markets weaken. Uh, they talk about the Golden Dragon again and the CSI. Uh, so thanks to my buddy for sending that over. You know who you are. 
and um, and then Exxon comes out swinging, saying, you're wrong. We kept investing to the uh, president's lovely letter. We kept investing even during the pandemic when we lost more than $20 billion. And uh, longer term government can promote investment through, quote, clear and consistent policy uh, implication. Your policy is unclear and inconsistent and changes like the wind in a windsock. Uh, and, uh, that support resource development and predictable lease sales, as well as streamlined regulatory approval and support for infrastructure, such as pipelines. Hello, administration knocking on the door. Anyone home? Anyone listening? Anyone paying attention to what is needed? Um, you know, anyway, uh, if they don't find out now, they'll find out in November. And um, that's, again, self-inflicted pain, uh, but maybe that's the only way they can get the message across. So uh, this is from Seth Golden via Bespoke, it looks like. Uh, last period of quantitative tightening was not a smooth ride from 2015 to 2018. Nonetheless, equity prices moved higher with outsized volatility. Previously, this was the greatest liquidity drain. Also, stocks greatly outperformed gold during this period. So uh, this looks perfect for actually what we're going to be going through. I, I, you know, I've said before, I could definitely see a sideways range for the next year and a half to work off the excess off the pandemic lows, uh, which looks a lot like 2018 to 2019 during this quantitative tightening, uh, where we kind of trade back and forth from the top end of the range. I think, uh, you know, the top end of the range is 4,800. So a range from whatever it is, 30, 30, maybe it goes to 3505, like that eerie chart, 3500 to 4800. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if it pushed up to 5100 just to suck everyone in before reopening the trap door uh, and having another correction. But um, but this this makes a lot of sense and it's a decent analog. Uh, this is my friend Tiho. Only 6% of the NASDAQ 100 stocks are above their 200-day uh, EMA, while only 9% are above their... 200 SMA, breath is pretty oversold with technology space right now. So you're just looking at all the times that you had similar situations. And again, it doesn't guarantee, but uh, there, there haven't been, there have been very few times where it got this oversold and, it, and you didn't get a, a big bounce, um, even in more serious situations like 2008 and, and the tech wreck. Um, Bank of America survey, you can check that out. We'll cover it in the article of the week. Um, Okay, take your medicine, stock market, and sentiment results. Uh, let's just see if we can do a few more commodities to give you a feel. Well, you can you can go to bar chart and actually do them on your own. I, I think it's because I've got so many tabs open and so many TVs on and so many computers going that this is like the fourth computer uh, and it's, it's the slowest. So, um, okay, so here we go. Uh, this is a chart of what happened the last time they did a 75 basis point hike. The thing that's interesting about it is did the hike here. So the market had been, you know, basically crashed early on in the year. Then it was just grinding sideways, a lot of volatility going nowhere, trading in a range. Then they finally did all in 75 basis points. Uh, you got a pop, then a rollover. The market didn't bottom. It bottomed slightly lower about a month later in December of 1994 and then barely closed positive for the year in total return, uh, one po plus 1.3% 1 for the S&P 500. Uh, and then by July of 1995, they did their first cut. So uh, from that cut, from that hike of 75 basis points, that was the end of 94, the next five years, uh, 95, 6, 7, 8, and 9, the S&P averaged 28.7% per year. Um, we may need to stay in this range for another year. We'll, we'll have to see, but, um, I do think we are in a secular bull here, the second half of a secular bull. So, uh, they normally last 18 years. Um, we've had about 10, give or take, uh, and the demographics favor it and everything else going. So, uh, but, but when we do come out of this, I think we're going to get uh, a nice move to the end of the decade. Um, I don't know if we'll get 28% per year compounded uh, for sure, but we do have a little bit to work off. But it goes to show you uh, when things look darkest. I'm sure a lot of people here, because if you look at the chart from 77 
to 94. It had just gone nothing but up. And this looked like the peak of all peaks, like 1929. And this looked like it was going to roll over. Uh, and sure enough, just the opposite happened. And you got another five years out of the cycle. So uh, that was that. Again, thanks to Liz and Ellie Terrett for having me on. Uh, and Ashley Webster. Uh, so some notes from that segment. We, we just went through a bunch of them. So, but you can see the hike here. Um, again, unclear if they can pull it off this time, considering the yield curve inversion signaling a shallow recession. We're going to talk about recession in a second. Um, but here you see that the 75 basis point hike, November of 1994. That's right here. Uh, it rallies and then rolls over and it actually bottoms a month later. And then by July 6th of 1995, uh, they're cutting. So they went up another 50 basis points after the 75 basis points, which I think we'll see. 75 now, 50 next month, pause, and then maybe starting cuts end of year or early next year, provided the CPI and PPI uh, come down. Um, and these were my notes uh, for the show on Tuesday, Fox Business. Uh, but I was basically making the case that while the Europe and U.S. are tightening, trying to slow consumption, there are two large economies in the world that are aggressively easing, trying to increase consumption, China and Japan. Three ways to play it. We talked about uh, Alibaba, of course, Taiwan Semi and Nike, which we've talked about before. Nike's got a huge China business. That's been the overhang on their stock. Um, while the U.S. By the way, this is interesting. This mirrors the RBC note I just got today. While... U.S. just marked a bear market close yesterday. China now appears to be coming out of a pronounced bear market that began 16 months ago. Now, the big R word, recession. Uh, the 210 spread already inverted and we had negative GDP in Q1. The definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Here's the latest estimate from the Atlanta Fed for Q2 GDP. They now have it at 0%. That's down from 0.9% on June 8th. So it's possible we could get two quarters of negative GDP. The market's already priced that in. And by the time we know we had a recession, which would be early next month, uh, um, the market will have already bottomed. The market bottoms um, usually well before the recession is declared and well before the data starts to improve. So uh, either we get it now or we get it next year, but it seems a foregone conclusion at this point, we will get some type of recession. We believe it's going to be shallow, but you know, the consumer starting to uh, cool down. Consumer sentiment is now back at the uh, great financial crisis levels or below, which is mind boggling. Um, and here's the question. What if we already had the recession and Q2 comes in negative? How much do you think is already priced in? Considering the U.S. indices marked a bear market low on a uh, bear market on Monday, down 20% on a closing basis, Nasdaq down 30%. We think most, if not all, of a mild recession has already been priced in. The market always bottoms before the data begins to improve. By the time they announce a recession, the market bottom will already be in the rearview mirror. That announcement could come as early as next month if we see negative Q2 GDP, or as late as mid 2023 if we don't. But our base case is it will have been or will be shallow. We covered in the last week the idea of peak inflation, while Friday's CPI number was a complete train wreck. Tuesday's PPI report, wholesale prices told a better story and is a leading indicator. So they all came in lower than estimated. As you look at the charts, you can see the peak was clearly two months ago. Um, this is consistent with a view we expressed on our podcast videocast that we could be peaking as it relates to inflation based on these in leading indicators. The in-spectrum tech PC DRAM contract price, um, the Drury shipping index, and the North American fertilizer index, uh, you can see, um, have all declined in recent months in a material way in their leading indicators. Then I want to thank Philip Yin and Ryan Gallagher for having me on CGTN. We covered inflation uh after the cpi report the used car impact how we think semiconductors are coming back etc we covered um uh whether inflation will get worse we we made the case about cars we talked about oil the rig count going up from uh now at 733 uh down from 792 pre-pandemic so that supply is coming back online and it's coming back online quickly so 
Uh, the key is going to be uh, refining capacity is going to be a bottleneck in the short term. So by the end of the year, uh, we'll see the impact at the pump and the recount will continue to rise if we don't get any other breaks sooner. Uh, commodity softening, uh, you can go through the charts on your own, but wheat, live cattle, cocoa, lumber, coffee, copper, soybean meal, gold, palladium. Uh, the only thing that's holding this up is oil, uh, and that's $20, $30 is the war, and um, that's that. So the PPI price index, I said we may get some relief from that. That's a leading indicator. We did. So the CPI I got wrong, the PPI I got right, yada da. Uh, I won't break my hand patting myself on the back for that one because the market is still uh, weak, but um, but there are, there are things to do. And um, is there any legitimacy to fears of possible recession? We're going to get a recession. It's just a question of whether we already had it, um, which, you know, would be kind of interesting, actually, uh, or if it's going to be next year. But again, we expect it to be shallow. And then Mitch Hawk, everyone loves talking with Mitch. We don't have show notes for Mitch. We just go with the flow. We talked hockey, energy, Russia, inflation, CPI, PPI, opportunity, sentiment, multiples, positioning, and more. Definitely check that out. Um, and then the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey this week. Four key points I want to lay out. Managers expect inflation to fall. Historically, they've been right. Uh, they expected it at, at the pandemic lows, at the great financial crisis lows. Sometimes it takes a few months for the market to bottom. Uh, the tech rec lows and the long-term capital management lows, and they were right in all of those instances. Uh, optimism on global growth hasn't been this low since, has only been this low at or near market bottom. So it was this low, it was, it was not this low, it was almost as low in the pandemic lows. Uh, the January 19 lows, that was after um, Powell blew up the markets in December of 18. Uh, it was this low during the great financial crisis. It was this low during August 2006. If you remember, managers were the most short tech than they, the highest tech shorts uh, last month since August of 2006. If you remember, the Nasdaq went up 42% over the next 18 months. Uh, and then December 20, two, December 2000, after the tech had crashed and the long-term capital management in 1998. Everyone, third, everyone thinks oil will continue to outperform while managers say inflation uh, will come down. They continue to chase energy. This sets up to be the pain trade of the second half with everyone crowding in uh, at the top. Uh, I, again, I think that, uh, you know, maybe you get a blow off top, but I think six months from now, it's going to be a lot lower. That'll be a chance to load up for the long term. I think the the long three to five year trend is still up, but I think short term, too many of the people that were so adamant that uh, we were done with oil in 2020. Uh, and I keep track of this because I want to see who's on the other side of my trade. All the people that were <laughs> bashing the hell out of Wells Fargo, bashing the hell out of energy stocks in 2020 are now all the ones that are like cheerleaders with pom poms. It's, 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 it's hysterical. Uh, and, uh, and I think just how they were hysterical on the bottom against it, they're hysterical on the top for it. You got to, you got to, take a few chips off the table if you haven't done already in in our humble opinion um what remains the most crowded trade long oil and commodities long us dollar short treasuries so you know that usually tells you what's next the opposite uh and then here's the hmm question of the day while pessimism continues to climb to all new highs so do earnings one of the two will have to come down soon my bet is that pessimism will come down more than earnings will come down and then these uh, sentiment measures are at extremes. This morning, the bullish percent dropped down to 19%. Again, lower than the pandemic lows. These are all times, you know, 2019, you wanted to be a buyer versus a seller. Uh, could this time be different? Sure, it could be different. But uh, where do the odds favor you? What are, what are the businesses that you own? Fear and greed at 18. And this is a lagged indicator. We'll get the new numbers today on the NAAIM. Consumer discretionary earnings. Um, uh, up two point, I'm sorry, is this consumer consumer discretionary? Up 2.1% in the past 60 days. Uh, uh, 2023 up 1.71. Um, if you go through consumer discretionary, it looks like a nuclear bomb hit all these charts. Uh, so there's there, I think there's a lot of opportunity on a, a stock by stock basis in that sector. And then we're going to get to the questions of the week. If you're on the podcast, go to hedge fund tips dot com 
uh, scroll down to the video cast, fast forward the uh, YouTube video to minute 60, you'll pick up word for word exactly where you left off. Um, and then I think consumer staples were flat, that's not coming up. Uh, the data, you know, we covered this, uh, the PPI better than expected. Uh, retail sales were not good. Uh, you got to build in crude inventories, so that's good. Uh, building permits were down. That's going to be that way for a while. People are dealing with this uh, quick interest rate shock. Uh, continuing claims actually moved up. So Powell is achieving his goal to put people out on the street and lower, de uh, lower demand. So he got the first taste of that this week. Continuing claims uh, worse than expected. Um, initial jobless claims were worse than expected, 229 versus 215. So the plan is working. And, um, you know, he's kind of boxed. I mean, I'm not criticizing him. He's kind of boxed, uh, but that's that's what's going to happen. And then, um, all right, so this guy asks, uh, Johnny, also please cover more on China. I think China's recovery may resemble the way U.S. came out of COVID. Just can't imagine CCP failing the economy. Okay, covered a lot of China. Uh, he's referring to the 1994 assessment. Uh, I agree with your assessment. The only concern I have comparing 1994 is that I remember the economy back then was not so great and job market was poor. Any thoughts? Then the economy just took off in 1995. I'd like to hear more about why this time may be similar to 1994. It may not be similar to 1994. You didn't have 8% uh, inflation, but I think if you look to the end of the year at 4% uh, or 5%, I guess, what did the Fed say? 5.6% this year and 2.4% next year. Um, so while jobs were worse in 94, in, uh, jobs are better in 2022, uh, inflation was better in 94. Inflation is worse in 2022. So um, nothing repeats, but it can rhyme. Uh, I think we could be in this trading range a little longer than we were in 94, um, potentially another year. But a move to the top of the range is a monster move, and you can make a lot of money in that uh, before we finally break out and resume resume the secular secular move. So um, want to go through a few questions of the week. Um, okay, from Adam D. Since December, what, what is this? February 28th. Okay, so that's not. Okay. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts about selling garbage weekly out of the money call option, say around 160, 170 strike and moving the strike upwards as the price climbs on your Alibaba position to raise some extra cash right now that implied volatility is high? That's uh, generally not my game. Um, I, I don't like to sell calls because um, I'm in the stock because I think it's going to go up for a while. If the stock gets called away, I mean, you had a 40% move. You, know, you had a 60% move in a matter of weeks. Um, stock gets called away. You got to pay taxes and you miss out on the huge upside. So uh, just just not my cup of tea. Uh, if you think the stock's going to go down and you want to sell calls against it, just, just get out of the stock. Um, two, uh, should I go the hedge fund route instead of the cliche investment banking to PE? Seems like you have a sweet lifestyle. Um yeah, you get a sweet lifestyle after, you know, 10 or 20 years of hard work and uh, making making some right decisions. But um, my network's full of IB and PE professionals, don't know signal. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, my thought is my skills are expanding from an analytical perspective. I think if you're going to go the discretionary long short, you need to get a CFA first. Uh, I think if you're doing it for money, go the PE route because you can play a lot more golf. Uh, but if you love the markets and you eat, sleep and breathe uh, markets, then go the hedge fund route. Uh, for me, I just love the markets. So this is a natural fit. Uh, but if, if it's a money decision, probably PE is uh, um, less hours. <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, OK, uh, JT Investor. Hi, Tom. After listening to last week's podcast after the CPI print was painful since the 25% scenario you described materialized, how does this change your view on markets for the second half? Also, 
Thanks for sharing your view on auto suppliers. I, you may recall I asked you about this topic in February when Tenneco was bought and it seems you were able to identify another number of comps in the space that are trading into deep value levels. Uh, if you have a view on Axel AXL, that would be appreciated. Uh, Axel's had a bigger run off the bottom, so I think there's less upside, but I think it's okay. Um, also, going back to the 2008 playbook, I'm sure you recall Canadian Tar Sands play. What are your thoughts on Suncor? Suncor is fine if you want a dividend, but it never goes anywhere. So, um, and I and again, I think it's I think that there, there will be better opportunities to buy energy again in the next 12 months. Uh, Matt Mitchell, hope all is well. Exciting to see things. Uh, thoughts on T Row currently sitting at 108. We've covered this before. Um, you know, if you you do a third, then you wait for the next flush. You do another third. Just build the position over time. It's generally okay if you look three years out. Uh, Patrick K. Hey there, thanks for everything. Your insight and problem solving has been an incredible learning opportunity. Uh, wanted to share an interesting article I read today about Lyft, who announced a new partnership with Ford. Okay, this is not a question, but um, thanks for sending it. Uh, yeah, Lyft and Uber, people are going to keep using that. They're, you know, they're in the doldrums. Maybe you get a little bit for the long term. Sané, Ray, hey, uh, out of the 733 oil rigs back online, how long do you estimate that'll take for their supply to enter the markets? Again, the supply will come. The question is the refining capacity. So it's going to be on a lag till anyone sees anything at the pumps, uh, not before the end of the year. Um, and thoughts on meta platforms, current price 160 close to shutdown lows. Uh, yeah, let long term. I like Meta. Uh, Zuckerberg always figures it out. And that's it for this week. So want to thank everyone for tuning in on a crazy day. Uh, still crazy day. Uh, but we'll be back next week, same time, same place. The good news is some of our core positions are finally uh, doing what we expect them to do. We expect continued follow through through, through the second half. But I think the theme is you have to be... Um, uh, you have to look at every opportunity on a discrete basis because the market is not your friend at the moment. That may change. Uh, but the companies we have and the sectors we have, uh, I think the timing is right. I think the margin of safety is right. I think the uh, positioning is right. Uh, now we just sit and wait. And when you have days like this, uh, I won't be doing any golfing today, but this is a day you should probably be golfing and sitting on your hands so you don't get tempted to do something stupid and sell an ownership stake in an unbelievable business with an incredible moat um, that, you know, two, three years out is a three bagger, or in the case of the special situation, maybe a 10 to 20 bagger, uh, or in the case of uh, biotech sector, a double plus. Um, you just have to kind of tune out the noise, let all the leverage funds and crypto nuts uh, deleverage, blow out of their positions, close down, uh, get off of TikTok, get off of Twitter, you see a lot of these people going silent. So we're, we're almost there. Uh, all the zealots are now super quiet. They've disappeared. Uh, and, um, and that's usually uh, a sign of better things to come. So with that said, we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.